So uh, the world has gone wireless and most of us are uh, probably carrying more than one uh, device that has wireless capability with us. But uh, what I find when, I, when I'm at one of these conferences is uh, if you reflect on where we've been and you look where we're going, it uh, truly is amazing how far the industry's come in the last, uh, last few years. Nine years ago is when the 3G services started in uh, Europe. And uh, now we're sending SMSs worldwide, billions of them. First iPhone was five years ago. The first iPad was three years ago. We'll look at its impact, uh, actually two years ago. And uh, it continues, Apple's iPad continues as the number one device in a marketplace that will pass 100 million units and that two years ago didn't even exist. And if we look at what's happening uh, right now in our industry between now and the end of calendar year 12, uh, iPhone and, the, and Apple and Samsung continue to challenge each other. In the first quarter, Samsung shipped about 44 million units and Apple shipped about 35 million units. And between the two of them, they accounted for 90% of the profitability in the cell phone space, in the smartphone space. And so this is a real challenge to innovation, as, uh, as the previous uh, presenter talked. The other thing that's happening, uh, uh, Microsoft has given an update that uh, Windows 8 is firming up and the beta release will come in August. So we will expect to see Windows 8 devices later this year. Uh, the uh, Forward Concepts has forecast that uh, they expect to see the first uh, uh, Windows 8 tablets in the fourth quarter time frame. And if we sit and look uh, further down here, uh, Intel is uh, in the marketplace. Uh, Lenovo has announced uh, some Intel-based phones that will start to ship. And then uh, we'll see tablets later on. And, and with the Samsung uh, Galaxy S3, which has uh, just been introduced in Europe, we're seeing the first quad cores showing up in smartphones. So there's a huge amount of performance that's going into smartphones. And Windows on ARM will really up, upset the status quo of the Wintel space. And as we go looking forward, by 2014, the smartphone marketplace will be the number one semiconductor marketplace. It, it is the number one semiconductor marketplace in 2011. And if we look at the ranking, mobile PCs, office PCs, and then tablets will be the number four market. So there's a huge move to where mobile and the ability to use these devices and connect with these devices is, is moving. Now over the last several years, uh, we've seen many people talk about the development of the cloud. There's a huge amount of services in the cloud. There's a huge amount of connectivity that we're using. Uh, I'm on the Wi-Fi network here in the Moscone Center and we're seeing machine-to-machine uh, -machine devices. There are uh, billions of devices that run browsers. There are, you know, five to six billion devices already that have IPv6. Pe some people say there are over 10 billion devices connected to the network today. And uh, 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 Siemens has given a forecast uh, where in 2020 they expect to have 20 billion devices. And Cisco's talked about 15 billion addressable devices. So if you look at the mobile devices that connect to uh, other devices, and we look at the services in the cloud, this is one of the toughest spaces in the semiconductor marketplace. If we look at the companies that are trying to stake out a play here, there are those that have their set of content in the, in the cloud, and then there are a number of device players that are, that are left uh, coming back. Apple has taken a vertical integration play basically covered all of these axes. Different members of, of uh, other companies have uh, taken similar plays. Google and Microsoft probably have the broadest footing and with Windows 8 you'll start to see Microsoft play in the uh, tablet and increase their play in the cloud space. Uh, we've even seen Facebook after their IPO two weeks ago we've seen them uh, talking about a uh, phone named Otto, codenamed phone as they're building development teams and we expect to see a Facebook phone some point in the future. We've seen uh, Nokia come back and retrench around, uh, around Windows and we've seen uh, Sony and Samsung uh, show old generation and new generation in terms of moving fast. So what's driving this complexity? What's making this happen? I mean the first thing is that we want we know what we want and we want the user experience to be faster 
We want to click through these screens. We don't want to delay to wait for them to build. We want them to build faster. The data that we're looking at is converged. I mean, we want the, the audio synced with the movie. We want the ability to run multiple streams on multiple devices. My wife watches television with her iPad at hand and her iPhone there as well so she can keep up and talk to, talk to the kids about what's on TV. But if you look at the range of devices, even digital picture frames are now getting connected and can be updated remotely as, as an IP addressable device. So, we've converged the world of computing, graphics, and audio and video. And when we look at this Christmas list, we find that not only does everybody want these, whether you're uh, pre-teens or post-teens, you want mobile products, you want things that run applications, and you want them to be blisteringly fast and just give you a delightful user experience. If we look at what that means in the marketplace, for this year we've seen single and dual core processors. We've seen uh, mostly 40 nanometer products with the first 28 nanometer products coming to marketplace. We're still predominantly in a single channel memory world, although 1080p video is pretty much all around us. And the complexity of the designs as you move from 40 to 60, I'm sorry, 40 to 28 nanometer, is adding about 50% more cores to the complexity of the designs that people are doing. So this means that it's more area, it's harder to do, and you need the ability of Moore's Law, be it 28 nanometer, to give you a shrink. But independent of Moore's Law, because of the push for user performance, the guy that uh, is the benchmark for most of us in the industry, Apple, over the last uh, three generations has grown the amount of area, all of these in 40 nanometer process nodes. And have gone from uh, a single A8 to dual core A9s, dual core A9s with four graphics planes. So a lot of performance to give the multiple windows on a tablet more performance. In addition to that piece of it, we've got cores coming from, from ARM and the rest of the industry that uh, are running at over two gigahertz. The video uh, GPU subsystems are speeding up and we're seeing LPDDR3 speeds move up to uh, 1.6 gigabits per second and DDR3 and 4 moving even faster than that. And 3D giving us the ability to stack DRAMs on top of the logic SOCs and still have as many as four channels. So we've got all these high performance uh, IP cores that do something with images and content and operating systems and applications and we've got the path to memory and what we've got to do is figure out how you're going to get the middle done, connect everything up, get it to work right. You need it to have keep the processors fed at the data rate and you need uh, to have a memory subsystem that allows you to very easily move your software base to multi-channel to get the improved bandwidth and performance. You need a design methodology that says, hey, on the, the first phase of the project, I defined the architecture, and that architecture needs to still be your architecture as you tape it out. By having virtual channels, I can make sure that the logical architecture is still preserved independent of layout issues, uh, and we can make sure that you get the performance as you finish place and route. If you look at the system when you start, you have this ARM core at three gigahertz, you got three gigabits of, of memory bandwidth. Hey, I just, I got plenty of performance on the edge of the chip. I just need to make sure that I don't mess it up as I do the implementation. So I want to have predictable performance as that increasing frequency goes up. And as we start to see power partitioning, there's more and more power partitions in designs. If we look at uh, 40 nanometer designs, we were seeing one to two handfuls of power partitions, three to five partitions, no more than 10 in a piece of silicon. But if you look at 28 nanometer, leakage current is still pretty high, and so you're using uh, power islands to uh, simplify the design by gating those devices off. If we look at a tablet design, we see that uh, each of these dotted lines represents a different uh, power domain. So we can actually turn off a fair amount of the system which becomes important in extending the battery life. If we look at uh, why you want the battery to be right, you want to make it as small as possible. Everybody 
these devices that uh, the teens and preteens want are all battery powered and what we need to do is we can't turn off the entire SOC but we certainly turn off the subsystems that we're not using at any point in time. And so let's go back and look at this tablet design and again we, we look at these uh, uh, seven or eight uh, power domains here and what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, the system runs as long as it can. So if we could have the hardware manage the turn on and turn off, then it would be far easier, especially if that was done automatically. That would encourage us to use more domains because we're not using software routines to turn these on and off, but actual hardware handshake lines, we can do it more quickly. And we start to move to a design that says, when I'm looking at an SOC with those 80 to 100 IP blocks or IP subsystems, I can actually do a much better job of power managing those if I have the capabilities that uh, Sonics SGN has in the interconnect. As you move from the CPU to this camera subsystem, you can see that you cross a couple of power domains. You can see that the video encode and decode is in a different power domain. Just the act of the CPU saying, let's take a picture, causes those handshake lines to turn on those subsystems. Once the subsystems are turned on, we've initiated some bus traffic. The interconnect knows if I'm moving a picture, for instance, I'm moving a 10 megapixel picture, and I haven't finished it till the last bus transaction has happened to move the last little bit of that, uh, that uh, picture image. I have full handshake as long as the transaction's going on, I keep the power up. Once the transaction's completed, I gracefully shut down the subsystems. And so what I've really done is I've, uh, I've allowed you to, uh, to have uh, this example here where the subsystems are powered off most of the time. And so what we really end up doing is uh, this is very much a safe shutdown. Again, full handshake that gives uh, the wake up, gives you the ability to manage more domains. And at the end of the day, by keeping more of this dark, you can save about 50% at the SOC level on total power. You can do this, uh, uh, you can verify this architecture in your simulation model. And so what we find is Sonics is helping people solve that middle of the SOC problem. How are you gonna take the gigahertz, the gigaflops, and make sure that uh, your memory subsystem connects that? Make sure that your chip is the best it could be, that it really exploits everything you've paid for, and that you do that with phenomenal battery life compared to competition. So if we look at these devices, we're typically sh selling these devices into cloud-connected uh, devices. So these are cloud-scale SOCs, and what we find in general is you want, if you move from the prior product, you want to have more performance, and you want to have less power, and you want to do that in a way that lets you get to market as quickly as possible. And so you can do that with Sonics today.